continue the, the word of prayer. Yes, Lord, we come before you this morning. We thank you that you will make a way. That as we come, Lord, in the midst of um, you know, all these distractions, you want to speak to us now. So we just quiet in our hearts and our minds and fix it upon you. So we just pray that you be guided and direct us, we pray. Yes, you wonderful master, we say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I thought it was awesome that the projector started working when we got to God will make a way. And, uh, I'm just going to ask Mauritian to come and do our morning reading. We're back in the book of Mark, um, which is exciting. We're going to be reading from Mark 3, 1 to 12. It should be up on the screen. No, the screen's gone. <laughs> but yeah, the lace the boy has something. Morning, everyone. Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. <coughs> Jesus said that a man with a deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil? Is it a day to save life or to destroy it? <coughs> but I wouldn't answer him. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, Hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. At once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. Crowds followed Jesus. Jesus went out to the lake with his disciples and a large crowd followed him. They came from all over Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Edomia, from east of the Jordan River, and even from as far north as Tyre and Sidon. The news about his miracles spread far and wide, and vast number of people came to see him. Jesus instructed his disciples to have a boat ready, so the crowd would not crush him. He had healed many people that day, so all the sick people eagerly pushed forward to touch him. And when every those possessed by evil spirits caught sight of him, the spirits would throw them to the ground in front of him, screeching, You are the Son of God, but Jesus sternly commanded the spirits not to reveal who he was. As we said, we're picking up back in the book of Mark, Mark 3, and today I want to ask you the question, do we believe in the, in that God is abundant? I know we've looked at, do we believe He's able, do we believe all these things, but do we believe God has unlimited supply and mercy and grace for all of us? Or do we believe that everyone has, that God has a little bag and He takes out and gives some to Linnell, which means it's less to give to Vicky, and as we go down the road, we get less and less of what God has for us, because He's too busy blessing other churches, other Christians, other people. Amen. <laughs> we, but, but we need to be careful this morning because very often we, we slip into that kind of mentality that when Abby was born, everyone told us that Abby must buy Seth a gift, um, even though she wasn't even born yet, so we bought the gift, surprise. Um, and I remember sitting with Seth giving him the gift because every book said that when a new child comes, the existing child is going to feel neglected, there's not enough time, there's not enough resources, that you need to include them as much as possible and, and make them like this new child loves them. But essentially life is, there's limited resources, no one has an endless bank balance. Anyway, if you do, please contact me, I'll help you with that. But anyone got endless patience? Endless time, endless whatever it is. And very often we see when we get into those situations with new children, there's a, a lack of, or a limitless amount of love, time, patience that we can distribute amongst the family. And what tends to happen though is we start to push that kind of thinking onto God. And we have this mentality as we see the Pharisees in the story this morning, if God is going to do good for them, if Jesus is going to bring healing or restitution, that's out of my blessing. So now I'm not going to be blessed because God is doing something in someone else's life that I want Him to do for my life. And then we fail to celebrate and get excited at what God's doing because essentially we think He's robbing from my back. He's taking from my blessing. And, and it makes it really difficult for us to be a people of celebration, a people of excitement, when we carry this, this Pharisee kind of mentality that God can only do so much and then He gets tired. Or He runs out of patience or He runs out of time. Right, he must be tired, he must have limited resources, or we think that he doesn't really care about me as much as he cares about other people. 
You don't have to put your hand up, but we sometimes feel that way with God, if we want to be honest. Same way as a child, you sometimes felt your mother preferred your other sibling more than you, whatever it is, or your father, whatever it is, is because we, there's limited resources, there's limited time, there's limited patience, and we push it on to God. Surely God cares about the, the, the bigger churches than He does for us little churches because He gives them so much more. They have so much more resources and people and skills and ability. So quickly we start to question, well, where do we play in God's kingdom? Where are we on the important scale? And, and, and when we start to throw that into our grace and the, the abundant love of God, we start to question, does God even know we exist? Does God even care? And, and, and we'll get to that. And in all of those things, we come back to the verse that we've kind of been repeating the last couple of months even, Isaiah 55 verse 8, that says, God's, way, God's ways are not ours. So it says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. And when we hear that saying, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, instinctively we hear the Father's voice that says, just do what I say. Instead of an encouragement, I've got so much more for you. Right? We, we hear it as it's dismissive that God's ways is His ways are better than our ways. But He's saying He's inviting us in to the excitement of what Jesus has for us. He's not trying to limit and say we're dumb, we don't know better, uh, or even though that's some elements of truth there. But He's trying to excite us that, hey, in Jesus there's so much more. In Jesus there's enough for everyone. Because the Bible is clear, God's ways is not our ways. That's the beauty of the cross. That's the beauty of Easter that we just celebrated, that God has rescued us and redeemed us and is calling us to freedom. The question becomes a struggle today from this morning's text is, are we willing to celebrate those that God is working in other people's lives and not just us? And when we go through wilderness and desert, are we willing to worship that God is taking people through seasons of blessing and abundance? And that God has enough to, uh, to bless everyone. If God is an abundant God, we should be an abundant people. Amen. And I'm not speaking about physically or financially here. So we're not prosperity here. But we should have an abundance of celebration that God is at work in people's lives all around the world, all around Jeffrey's Bay, at all different churches. And He's doing something great. And we get to be part of that and celebrate it. Maybe our biggest blessing will come by the sharing of other people's testimonies and celebrating what God is doing in other people's lives because it bolsters our faith that we have a God that is able. But how instinctively we make it about competition, instinctively we make it about that we want to bless Him, we want to keep everything, rather than celebrating what God is doing in other people's lives. Amen. Just me. Not just me. <laughs> and, 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 and there's this understanding that we're going to try and have and when we get to, to the Mark text in a moment, is that there's an abundance of God's grace that we are not on the outside looking in. We are included in the body. His ways are inclusive of all God's children for His blessing. He just pours it out differently at different times, but it's not limited. It's a limitless abundance of the grace of God. That's the, the, the challenge of, of Ephesians, that we will not experience the depth of God until we are plugged into a community of believers and celebrating what God is doing in and around and through that community. And the community, both the church at large and our small, uh, smaller churches, as we see going on around us. And Paul writes throughout Scripture, you go and read the beginning of all Paul's, not all his letters, but the majority of his letters, there's this an excitement to say, hey, I've heard about what you're doing. I've heard about what's going on in your life. I hear that the Spirit is moving, that the church is growing, that people are being blessed, that people are being healed. And you know what? I've continued to pray for you that that would increase more and more. He doesn't say, hey God, where's my blessing? He doesn't say, hey God, why are you moving over there and not here? He surrenders and says, God is at work and His ways are not my ways. And I'm going to celebrate that God is still at work in the world today. And that's Colossians 1 verse 9 to 10. It says, so we have heard, not stop praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of His will and give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. So He's not only praying um, for, that. He's not only celebrating, but He's praying for increase. The people in your life that, that seem to be abundantly blessed financially, physically, whatever it is, do we pray for increase in their lives? Or do we begrudgingly pray, Lord, where's my Right? That's the, the, the easiest way to examine our hearts this morning. And I'm not speaking about money, but so often we, we see God blessing people and we don't pray for increase that they would know the will of God, the knowledge of God. Why is God blessing them? Because there's a purpose and a will for their blessing that God is going to steward for His glory. Do we pray that? Do we do we do that? Or do we just say, oh, Lord, you forgot about me again? Lord, why must I endure hardship? Why must I do X, Y, Z? Why am I not part of the, the bountiful harvest of financial gain and I've got to navigate life 
because God has a plan and a purpose that's unfolding in our lives. And he goes on, he says, you know, in Colossians go on that. And, and that's the, the challenge this morning, is what are you celebrating that God is doing in, that, in the moment? And, and I want us to reflect on that just as we ask, what are you celebrating that God is doing? Because celebrating what God is doing is really good for building worship life. But what are you celebrating that God is doing in other people's lives? The Pharisees in the text this morning were quite upset that the guy got healed. They were trying to trip Jesus up. They were really angry that Jesus was doing what Jesus does because it didn't include them. It's easy for me to celebrate when, when I'm being blessed, when I'm receiving things, when God is speaking to me and directing my life or whatever it is. But when I see Him blessing other people, directing and empowering other people, and I seem to be in the stale season of dryness or whatever it is, am I celebrating what God is doing? Or am I placing myself at the center? Because that's essentially that the Pharisees wanted to be center of the story and kick Jesus out. Very often, if we're honest in our own walk with God, we want to be center story of God's redemption plan and we forget Jesus at the door. And, 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 you know, and, and, and looking around uh, at who you, um, the people around you, are you looking to celebrate them or are you looking for them to mess up and trip up? We become more angry at God because He doesn't love like He wanted to, He doesn't move like He wanted to. But we're quite happy that His ways are not our ways because it means our salvation. But we're quite upset with God when He unfolds His salvation as He sees fit to redeem us and, and to make us more and more like Him. And like the Pharisees, are you watching people to critique them, to wait till they fail, to wait till they mess up so you can say the words we love? It's, I told you so. You should have listened to me. Instead of celebrating that God is setting them free, that He is empowering them for, for whatever season in their lives. So let's read again the first two verses from Mark 3. It will be on the screen, <laughs> but if you have your Bibles, that would be a great start. Um, the first two verses. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. In hand. And since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. And the law meant, the Sabbath law meant you could not do any work on the Sabbath. So if you cut your finger, you were legally allowed to stop the bleeding, but you weren't allowed to put ointment on. You weren't allowed to do anything that would better the situation. You could stop the situation, but not better it. And that's why the Pharisees are looking and saying, well, if Jesus is going to heal the man, he's making it better because it's not a life and death situation of the hand. And Jesus is seeing the compassion and moved by this man's hand and seeing the Pharisees' hearts that were trying to trip him up. And, and, and it's wonderful because what we see in the text, by the Pharisees' expectation, they acknowledged Jesus was the Son of God. Because they waited in anticipation. They knew Jesus had authority and power and influence like no one else ever had. So there's this idea that Jesus was the Son of God. He had power and authority. They expected Him to do something. Um, so much so that they, they rationalized later on that He must be of God, uh, must be of Satan. And we'll preach about that next week, the unforgivable sin. So come for that, that's a good um, thumbnail clickbait. <laughs> um, and, and we'll unpack later on when they start to accuse Jesus for working with Satan. But, but we see that acknowledging His power and authority, they just didn't like the implications in His life, in their lives. Right? None of us, we, we acknowledge God's goodness, His authority, His mercy, but we don't often like the implication in our lives, of how that plays out, how that affects character and every aspect of our lives. Right, so, so they knew Jesus was different, they knew he had power and authority, but they, they make excuses for living out they wanted and living by rules rather than relationship. That's the, 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 the war, whatever you want to see, against the disciples and the Pharisees and the religious leaders. The one lived by rules and regulation, and they believe because we live by rules and regulations, we are entitled to blessing, we are entitled to the Lord to move on our behalf, that when we do X, Y, Z, He must do X, Y, Z. When the disciples understood that they are purely saved by relationship only because of who God is, because of what Jesus has done on their behalf. So everything they experience is by grace and mercy and surrender to God's ways, not their own ways. The disciples never try to get into the kingdom based on works. The Pharisees were always doing everything based on works. And, and there's no greater, greater guard and stronger boundary than relationship. That's what we see, right? It's more powerful to direct our lives and contain them than any rules can ever be. That's the, the contrast. And if you think of a marriage, there's no rule, and I'll tread lightly, there's no rule that says you cannot cheat on your wife. Is there a rule other than biblical instruction? If I go to the court right now and say I cheated on my wife, they're like, that's fine. But do you want a divorce? Don't you want? There's no consequences. 
right? But because of the relationship you have with your spouse, do you want to cheat on her? No, you want to walk in obedience, you want to love her, you want to respect her, you want to act in a way that says you're married to one woman as God instructs, and, and, and from that produces blessing. And, and that's what we see from Scripture. We're more aligned through relationship to walk in obedience to the things of God, to surrender to God, because we have a growing love for God, rather than we must obey to get X, Y, Z. And, and, and that's what we see, that the contrast between the Pharisees are continually walking in obedience to the law, trying to hold Jesus to the law because they want the blessing that comes from the law and not the blessing that comes from, and the freedom that comes from the relationship. And, and they knew what Jesus could do, they knew, but their knowledge didn't draw them closer to Jesus, it drew them further away from Jesus, it drew them against Jesus. And we know we need to be growing in knowledge of who Jesus is, what he has done. That's why we gather as a church to hear sermons. That's why we have Bible studies. That's why we read the scripture for ourselves. That we would grow and be reminded of who Jesus is and what he has done. But are we like the Pharisees that actually take offense to Jesus? That Jesus doesn't act and live like you would want him to. Can we agree? Amen. That's fine. We can. Jesus doesn't, and, and we always say, if you read the Bible, then it never upsets you or offends you or takes you out of your comfort so you're not reading the Bible. Amen. Right? That's the God we serve. His ways are not ours. That's why we're all here, saved by grace. Amen. Amen. And you don't have to look around and point fingers, but if you did, who would you exclude from this room if you were God? Based on preference, color, financials, whatever, right? God includes all of us because His ways are not our ways. And we're saved by grace, not by overcoming sin or those things. Those things come later on as we walk with God, but we're saved by grace. So is the knowledge of God drawing you closer to Him in expectation that He has power and authority or is it drawing you away from Him? Because we see it all the time. The more and more we walk with God, the enemy opposes us and comes against us, but, but, it, become, but it challenges our way of thinking and acting. People want self over surrender. I'll come back to that in a moment. Verse 3. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, Come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to the critics and asked, Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or destroy it? But they wouldn't want him. He looked around at them angry, angrily, um, and that word is like a fury, like a, like a burning rage, but not um, sinful rage. We'll get to that. And, and was deeply saddened by their hearts. Then he said to the man, Hold out your hand. And the man held it out to his hand, and it was restored. And once the Pharisees went away and met with the Herodians to plot against Jesus. Even on the Sabbath, Jesus knew it was always a good time to do good. Amen. Amen. We cannot, as believers, take a break from doing good. The scripture says, do not grow tired of doing good. It means we're continually doing good. And the Holy Spirit loves to move in the inconvenient good. We speak about it all the time. When you're ready for a nap and your doorbell rings. Right? Or, or you just want to throw the loaf of bread from the inside of the house. But Jesus says, put peanut butter. Right? Amen. We, know it's, uh, we are inconvenienced by good, but the Holy Spirit sees it as an opportunity to share the love of God. In how we act and how we react to people and interact with people. That's what we see going on here. Jesus doesn't shame or make a spectacle of the man with the, the deformed hand. He loves him and he challenges the Pharisees. That's why his heart is broken. Because the Pharisees are exploiting and not caring for the destitute and the broken and the outcast. They rather care about looking the part and saying the right things. They care more about the law and regulations than they do about the lost and the broken and the destitute. And, and, and that's the, the challenge. Is do we see the inconvenient good or do we see the opportunity to love like Christ calls us to love? Galatians 5.13 tells us, it says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. It's the, income, the Holy Spirit lives to move and challenge us in the inconvenience of good. When we're tired, when we're frustrated, when we run out, when we're at our wit's end, that is when the Holy Spirit is expecting us to step into what He has for us, to rest in Him and His empowerment. And, and we must guard against our lives, uh, guard our lives against thinking we are better than others, more deserving than others. That's the trap of the Pharisees. When we view other people, when we see other people as less than or imperfect or whatever it is, we become like Pharisees, thinking we're saved by law instead of grace. And, and, and we see it. And if we're honest, and, and maybe the Pharisees felt like that. So often we feel like we're on the outside looking in. 
Do we get upset when God moves in other people's lives and not us? We feel like we've been through so much, we've done so much, God owes us. Anyone ever, if you want to be honest and confess this morning, no, don't put your hand up. You ever feel God owes you? Your prayer life's full of God. When are you going to do this for me? I've come to church, I've paid my tithe, I've done everything, I've done everything you've told me to do. When are you going to reward me? And, and, and that mentality slips in and then we become upset because what we're praying for, what we're trusting God for, the breakthrough He gives to the guy next to us. And then all of a sudden we're like, hey God, your aim's a bit off. The guy next to me has done nothing. The guy next to you, he has nothing to offer, but you bless him in the poor mind, but his heart is right, and he pursues the Lord in relationship. We pursue the Lord in the Lord. And we get upset. And, and the Pharisees must have felt entitled. Right? The Pharisees, their whole role and job was to foretell this is the Messiah coming. Right? So imagine as a Pharisee, you, you, you have this prestigious position and you're going to usher in the new kingdom, you're going to usher in the Messiah, you've surrendered your life to it, you've done all the teaching and the learning and, and in all the sacrifice and now the Messiah comes and He doesn't even acknowledge you, He doesn't even invite you in and He takes a bunch of sinners and outcasts and, and filth and He says, these are the ones that are going to take us and usher in the kingdom. You ever felt like a Pharisee? Not so much in the religious law, but on the outside looking in. God doing a work right next to you. God moving right next to you. And when we see the barrier to entry is the state of the heart. Not the people themselves. Because throughout Scripture we see Pharisees coming to faith. We see people surrendering to who God is. The barrier to entry to the kingdom is the state of our heart and why we pursue Jesus. Do we pursue Jesus for what He gives us or because of who He is? That He is the Son of God. He is worthy of it all. He is um, um, the King of Kings. And God's inviting us this morning into a relationship this morning without entitlement, right? Without reimbursement for our lives lived, either good or bad. Right? God is a God of blessing and abundance and all of these things. But there is no payment for salvation. The payment was in Christ Himself. And how many of us come to Christ thinking, hey God, I've got something for you. Hey God, it's a good thing you saved me because you were lacking in a couple of areas. I can help you. Right? Instead of saying, God, I'm here to, to surrender in relationship. He's inviting us in for the abundance of Jesus. Some of our biggest struggles with church or with Christians is we come with an attitude of entitlement rather than an attitude of surrender to Christ. And we all do it in, in, in our different ways. And we find to find rest belong belonging, to be loved and to love. And in the same part, I'll say again, God does not take from our blessing to give to anyone else. Amen. Amen. There may be limited resources in the one pot that God's currently blessing you from, but that does not mean He doesn't have the cattle in the thousand years. And, and it's so important we start to rationalize and understand that God's blessing doesn't come in the means that we determine it comes from. It comes from Him who is able and great and generous. You have to know that this morning. And we read, as I've said, that Jesus was angry at the religious leaders. He was angry that they had spent all this time in Scripture and together and serving or exploiting the community, but they would not recognize Him as the Messiah, and they would not love the outcasts and the destitute. They were more cared about what the law said than what Jesus' heart was. And we know Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So in none of this is Jesus saying, hey, the religious law is done. So that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying we throw out tradition and, and religious law. That has its place. But first and foremost is the Father's heart for people. To see them restored and redeemed and walking in relationship. And Jesus had, and, and, and amazingly, Jesus had compassion on those because it said that his heart was broken. Time and time again, Jesus' heart is broken for those who would persecute him um, or swear at him and whip him and beat him. That Jesus exemplifies abundant love. If Jesus could love in that moment the Pharisees that would betray him and hate him, how much more, not how much more, but he can love us. There's nothing we can do that would separate us from the love of God. That's what Scripture teaches. That's what the accomplishment of the cross of Christ is. Amen. Amen. That was a good one. Amen. Amen. And, and here's the thing, that, right? We must take heed of the warnings of the compromise we see playing out in the Pharisees' lives. That they would join the, the Herodians, those that served Herod. They were on different teams, had different agendas and dreams and all these things, but they came together as a common good to destroy Christ, to defeat Christ. 
And when we become disgruntled with God, it leads to compromise and the inviting of sin instead of avoiding sin. I'll read it again. When we become disgruntled with God, it leads to compromise and the inviting of sin instead of the avoiding of sin. When we become angry that God owes us, that He that we followed the law, we've done everything right, and He's not moving like I want Him to move, we are quicker to sin, quicker to justify and become the victim in our own lives than surrender to who God is and His ways and His hands. And we see it in the Pharisees' life, and they, they, them and the, the Herodians, they were like oil and water. And yet, their hatred for Jesus, that He would dis, cause discomfort or surrender their own lives, made them work together to the point that they would kill Jesus. And it's amazing when things don't go our way, how quick we are to cross ethical lines, to, to twist stories that suit us, that makes us the victims. That's what the Pharisees are doing. And all of us need to be aware of this in our own lives. The ethical boundaries or whatever it is that we are willing to cross in the name of even the gospel or religious law, whatever it is, and out other people, whatever it is, so that we are the victims and not um, saved by grace and God's mercy. And when we find ourselves partnering with an enemy against that which is good, it should be a red flag. The Pharisaical movement or, or whatever, the institute, whatever, they should have put up red flag and said, hey, the fact that we want the same thing the Herodians want, that's a problem. When we want the same thing culture wants, when we want the same thing um, our, our flesh is hungering after, when we start aligning with things that are clearly not a biblical principle and guiding, we need to take a step back and see the red flags in our own hearts. And, 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 and that's what's so important to go back. Are we disgruntled with God? Are we upset with God that He's blessing others and not us, that He's moving in ways around us and not within us? Because that's going to lead to compromise. It's going to lead to an inviting of sin rather than an avoiding of sin. And it's such a fine line because we think as long as well, we're, we're inviting sin in but we still hate sin, then it's okay. We start to justify and play with it rather than flee all temptation that Scripture teaches. And the news of Jesus, what he was doing was spreading radically. It was awesome um, healing, uh, as Mauritius read, he was healing and doing all of these things. And it says, the news about the miracles had spread far and wide, verse 8. And vast numbers of people came to see. Jesus instructed his disciples to have a boat ready so the crowd would not crush him. He had healed many people that day. All of the sick people were eagerly pushed forward to touch him. Touch him. And whenever they possessed by evil spirits caught the sight of him, the Spirit would throw them to the ground in front of them, shrieking, You are the Son of God. And what's awesome, this is the first time that, that um, Mark makes the public proclamation that He is the Son of God. Up until this point, He's been showing healing and teaching and, and outcasts. It hasn't been a public profession that this is the Son of God. And now that even the, the demons get that right. But Jesus sternly commanded the Spirit not to reveal who He was. And what would you say is your driving motivation towards Jesus? This morning. What we say, what brought you to church? What draws you to scripture? What draws you to prayer? Right? Because throughout scripture we see people pursuing Jesus for what he does and not who he is. Right? They're pursuing him, and as we like to say, they had free medical aid, free food, free everything when they went to Jesus because he was bringing healing and restoration and all of these things. But as soon as they learned the implication of the teaching and the accepting of Christ as Messiah, that he is King of Kings, he determines how we live our lives, how we spend our money, how we do all these things, what community we're part of, they started to walk away. Time and time again, they were like, these teachings are too difficult, they're too well, restrictive, whatever it is, because they wanted the creation over the Creator. That's what we've been looking at. And it's such a fine line, because we can't separate who Jesus is and what He does for us. And, and it's too difficult to try to say, well, this is who Jesus is, the Son of God, the Trinity, Virgin Birth, all these things, and He brings healing and restoration and freedom and goodness and hope. They're one in the same. But very often we can address our motivation and say, okay, what is driving me to the feet of Jesus? Because if I'm driven to the feet of Jesus only when things are bad and not when things are good, I may only be pursuing Jesus for what He gives me and not who He is. Right? If we only ever rock up when life's falling apart and not when life is good, we may just want Jesus for what He does for us and not who He is. If we want Jesus to approve our choices, approve where I'm going in life instead of surrendering and asking Him for direction and guidance, we may only be going to Jesus because of who He is or because what He offers and not who He is. If, and I'll tread lightly, if Jesus does not feature in our budgeting and our spending in our lives, we may only be coming to Jesus for what He gives us and not who He is. 
And, and that's what we see time and time again. There was crowds of people rushing to Jesus. There would have been, if you were the disciples, you would have been so excited. Look how the kingdom is growing. Look at all these lives transformed and changed. And Jesus continually steps back. And we see people get, being offended or, or not met with their physical needs um, because they're not taking seriously their spiritual connections and fault. Right? We are called to show up in every season. We see that though. And we're called to pr- pursue Jesus for His guiding and directing in our lives. What motivates you this morning? What motivates you? Do you love Jesus or do you love what Jesus does? Do you love the church or do you love what the church does for you? And, and it's really, a, it's a fine line, so I don't want us to get too caught up in those things, but in those, pra- in those practical areas, do I only show up when I'm in need? Do I only, um, you know, do I only ask God's approval rather than His directing? Does my, my finances have nothing to do with God and His kingdom and the implications of Scripture in our lives? Then we may just be pursuing God for what He gives us and not who He is. Because it has to have an inconvenience in our lives to show that we are truly committed to relationship. And again, I'll show it last year. I know I'm using marriage so much this morning. Marriage, the marriages that succeed, the marriages that thrive are made up of compromise. Right? You get young married couples that are like, oh, we're never going to compromise. We are who we are. No. You're going to just fight. You're sinful people that get sinful one another. Marriages that succeed or marriages that compromise, not on ethics, or, um, again, but they compromise to know that you're there to love and serve one another. There's an implication on all of those areas. You can't just be married when you're upset. You've got to be married when you're in a good mood as well. You can't, be, you can't just show up when you need something. You need to show up when you need it. You can't just spend your money on yourself and not just fight. It's going to cause issues. And, and we see time and time again, if we're going away from this religious law that is so confined and, and hard onto um, the freedom and relationship with God that determines our steps, we understand the importance of relationship, of showing up. So how do we cultivate, very quickly, how do we cultivate um, a love for Jesus? Right, our prayer has been always, Psalms 51 verse 12, it says, Restore to me the joy of salvation. Rejoice, restore to me the joy of your salvation. In other words, Lord, I want to feel the same way I feel about you now that I did when I first got saved. When your spirit first entered me and I was saved and I was excited and I loved your word and I loved your people and you were doing things in and around and through me. I want to feel that same way. Amen. We want that, that first love. Revelations warns, I think it's the church of Ephesians, says you guys are great. You love each other, you provide for each other, you do all of these things, but you've forgotten me. In other words, we've become so good at pretending or living Christian lives that we've forsaken the God that empowers us to live. And and it's about coming back to it, right? Coming back to who God is. And it goes, restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. And and it's great. So it says, the way we are reignited in our love and our passion for Christ is through obedience to His word. Right? And now we don't like it anymore. Not I liked it, but I could just live how I wanted and still be in love with you. No, it says you want to be reignited. You want to be excited about your faith, that you're going to heaven and on hell, that you are united and all these things. It comes from obedience to God's calling in your life. Right? And, and, and we don't need to overcomplicate this with kind of, I was trying to think, how do I cultivate a love for Jesus? Um, how do I cultivate a, a desire for the things of Jesus? And, and very quickly, I think there's five points um, they are quick. You don't have to overcomplicate it. It's relational, not law based. Relationships have ebbs and flows from day to day, but there, there needs to be intentionality. There needs to be purpose. So, number one, be purposeful in your interactions. Be purposeful in your interactions with Jesus. Invite him in, include him in. I text Vicky all day, every day, not because I'm keeping tabs on her or she's on me, but because I like to include her in my life, because I care about her, I love her. In the same way, I pray throughout the day. Why? Because I know I need Jesus, and I need Jesus to fill me and direct me as I engage in different meetings and interactions or Bible prep or or church prep, whatever it is. I need Jesus. So in the same way, and I tried it once, it didn't work. When me and Vicky started dating, I told Jesus I would read a scripture before I sent a text message. Um, no, that never worked. <laughs> Didn't even last a day. <laughs> but, but the idea is, I wanted to be in, as intentional as I was in my pursuit for Vicky, I would be in my relationship with Jesus. That I'm always communicating, I'm always including, okay, Jesus is here, He's with me, I need Him, I need His guidance directly. Be purposeful with your interactions. Be intentional with your time. 
We have limited time, limited resources, all of these things. You need to be intentional with your time. I don't always go on, on dates with Vicky. For the record, I don't go on dates with anyone else. Um, <laughs> but we, we don't date as much as we should, life, busyness, whatever it is. But when we do, it's an intentional, solid block of time that we spend with each other, talk about things together, life together, and, and that carries you through the hardships, the, the, the storms, whatever it is. In the same way, are we creating intentional time with the Word of God, with Jesus, that we can be, never cease praying, be on our, our all around including Jesus, that we're not being full like Jesus in Mark 2, that continually went in solitude and spent time with the Father. We're not going to know the Father. We're not going to reflect the Father very well in our daily activities. We have to be intentional with that time. We need to fill our lives with the Word of God, the goodness of God, as we navigate the storms. Number three, be aware of distractions. It's always good. There's always, and as someone said in our midweek Bible studies, it says the devil, if he can't destroy you, he'll just distract you. Right? We become so filled with life and everything going on around us that we, 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 we get distracted. That the Bible warns, Song of Solomon warns about foxes in your vineyard. And I've spoken about them before. Foxes are really cute. If I could have a phoenix fox as my pet, I would love it. But just the thing about foxes, they bite. And they dig and they destroy Distractions very often are cute and noble and they look good and they look like this is what I should be doing for the Lord. But at the end of the day, they're there to destroy and tear down and bite. We need to be very wary of the things we commit to. Um, which brings us to our fourth point, what you should be committed to. Committed to a community. Why should you be committed to a community of believers? First of all, we believe it's biblical. But because passion breeds passion. When you're around people that love the Lord, when you're around people that are reading Scripture and praying and sharing testimony and encouraging, that's going to breathe into your life. That's going to sow seeds of joy and happiness. When you're around bitterness or anger or frustration, whatever it is, that's going to breathe into your life. You need a community of believers because God has called us together, not forsake the, the community because He will pour out His blessing. We need to be committed to community. Church is designed to, to, that we would grow into who God wants us to be. To walk in a manner worthy of the court. You can grow strong alone. You can be a Christian and never come to church. Amen. You can text everyone in there. It's not just this morning. Brad said it's fine that you went to church. You, you, will, you will just not live in the fullness of what God has for you. I am 100% convinced from that. From scripture, Paul, Paul writes to the Ephesians says that you know the heart and the depth and, and the awesomeness of God. It's written in a community of believers. We will not know the depth of God, the goodness of God, the mercy of God, apart from the community of believers. Right? Whatever that community looks like, whatever it is, we need to be in community. We grow stronger alone, but we thrive in community. And lastly, we cultivate our love for Jesus when we speak to others about Jesus. How do I remind myself that, hey, Jesus is able, He is worthy, He is powerful. I share that with other people. When I hear testimonies, when I hear things going on, when I read scripture, whatever it is, when we remember what God has done for us, right? When Joshua draws the line in the sand and says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. He just spent a whole bunch of verses saying, hey, remember God. Remember how God rescued you out of Israel. Remember how God out of Egypt. Remember how He provided in the wilderness. Remember that God. That's the God we're submitting to. Not a hope of a future, but a, a security of a, a God of our past that carries us into the future. Do we share that we need to speak more about Jesus? Intentional. And this doesn't mean, I'm not saying stand on the street corner on your soapbox proclaiming the gospel of God. If God calls you to do that, please do it. But to be intentional with sharing God's hand in your life, how He's guided and directed, how He has shown up time and time again. With the confidence and the boldness that people would know that God is active and real in your lives, that He's good, He's for you, not against you. And in all of that, that we would again learn to celebrate what God is doing in other people's lives. That's what it is. We speak about Jesus, not just what He does in our lives, but what He does in other people's lives. How radically different our lives would look, our communities would look, if we threw aside all the gossip of everything that's wrong and ill and... and, and enticing and shared more about what God is doing and, and His power and mercy in our lives. That we would set the tone and environment around us by sharing the goodness of God. Revelation says, by our testimony and the, the blood of Jesus, lives are changed. People are restored. So as the band comes up, um, yeah, that's, that's a challenge for us this morning. Celebrate what others 
or what God's doing in others' lives, realize that He is not taking from your bank to give to anyone else. He is an abundant love. And, and the barrier to entry, the barrier to entry, we're saved by grace by Christ alone, but our barrier may just be a pharisaical heart that makes an entitlement about us, about what we want and need, rather than what Christ has already done. And how He's moving us to surrender to His ways in our lives. Let's pray. Yes, Lord, we just come before you this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you've made a way by being the way. We thank you, Lord, that you showed compassion even if there was no inconvenient time for good, Lord. When you were beaten and bruised and, and shamed, Lord, you saw it as good to love us, to extend forgiveness. So we thank you for that, Lord. And Lord, this morning we pray that we would all examine our hearts, Lord. Examine our hearts, Lord, and show me where you are. Show me what it is, the state of our hearts, Lord, that we've been using you, Lord, as a genie, as a piggy bank, whatever it is, Lord, that we have, like the Pharisees, kind of been on the outside looking in, begrudged or gruntled that you're doing things that we, we wouldn't do at all. You're doing things for others that are cost and broken, and you've kind of forgotten us, Lord. That there's a, a sense of entitlement that is growing in our lives. Maybe because of how we've grown up, because of what we've done for the church, what we've given to the church, what we've whatever it is, Lord. Sacrifice, Lord. This morning you just want to set us free from that, Lord. You want to invite us into a relationship that we would know the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the abundant love of God. So we just surrender to that this morning. Lord, we know, Lord, when we, you would help us take captive our thoughts when we become upset that you're moving elsewhere, Lord, we would celebrate that. We would be excited by that. So this morning, Lord, we pray that prayer of the Psalms restore to us the joy of our salvation. Restore to us the joy of, of the living, real, loving relationship with you. Do you have abundant love for all? We thank you for that, Jesus. Be with us now as we sing in the name of the mighty man. Thank you, Jesus.